Hello everyone. In today's episode, we'll be diving into yet another unsettling case from North Carolina, renowned as the cradle of country blues and the homeland of the Cherokee Indians. Presently, North Carolina stands as a relatively conservative and affluent state located in the upper segment of the South Atlantic states. Contrary to South Carolina, it's notably tranquil on the crime front. When it does garner attention on national media, it's typically due to weather-related events like snowstorms, tornadoes, and intense thunderstorms rather than crime. The real threats often come from the natural environment, be it the coastline battered by tropical storms and floods, or the vast expanses of dense wildlife sanctuaries prone to wildfires and landslides, more so than from human actions. However, exceptions do exist. On the 10th of April, 2019, the disturbance was sparked by 17-year-old Tristan Barras. Hailing from a devout and sizable family, the young man brutally slaughtered his family members at their residence in Deep Gap, North Carolina. On that Wednesday evening, a distress call was made to emergency services by a young woman. She reported discovering a significant amount of blood within her home and noted the absence of three family members, her parents and her younger brother, stating that she was unable to make contact with them. Law enforcement responded swiftly to the distress call, making their way to Deep Gap, situated close to a mile from the boundary between Watauga and Wilkes counties. Upon arrival at the scene, patrol officers observed bloodstains along the path leading to the residence, on the doorstep mat, and a trail of blood inside the house that extended upstairs. During an exterior search of the premises, Officers discovered the body of a man concealed beneath a hammock, camouflaged with leaves and bearing multiple stab wounds. Subsequently, around 10.30 p.m., they located the family's pickup truck concealed in the forest. Inside, they found the body of a woman, covered with a blanket and obscured further with bags of mulch. This incident represents a tragic and irrational act of domestic violence. Jeffrey Barras, the father of Tristan and born on April 16, 1975, served as the pastor for the conservative Pist Bible Fellowship Church, a Protestant denomination with roots in the Mennonite tradition. Raced in an environment where personal devotion and the sense of being perpetually observed by a stringent and vigilant. God were emphasis Sid, the boy's upbringing was deeply rooted in these principles. Rigorous Bible study sessions and moral teachings formed the cornerstone of his early life. In this setting, any form of amusement, including laughter and the wearing of bright colored attire, was met with disapproval. Valued principles within their community included charitable acts, missionary endeavors, loving one's adversaries, and a staunch rejection of violence in any form. Jeffrey, inheriting these core values from his father, Pastor Harry Barace, matured into a compassionate, tender-hearted, and patient individual. During his youth, Jeffrey secured a summertime position at the Big Surf Water Park, located alongside Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri. It was here, on his initial day, that he encountered a gentle and endearing young woman named Tanya Mae Trandum. Sharing his age, perspectives, and a remarkably similar background, Tanya had also been raised in a household where Christian morals were deeply ingrained. Recognizing in Jeffrey the qualities of an ideal spouse and a devoted father, she presented him with a photograph of an elderly couple intertwined in handholding, symbolizing their potential future together with the words, that will be us one day. Kathy Brown, Jeffy's mother, fervently prayed for her son to find a spouse who would love the Lord wholeheartedly, believing strongly that her prayers were met when Tanya entered his life. The young couple wed, and their family life became an extension of the values and principles they were both nurtured in. The photograph Tanya had given to Jeffy, symbolizing their enduring commitment, was meticulously preserved in the family album. Not long after their marriage, they welcomed their first child, a delightful daughter named Taylor, followed by three more children in succession. The youngest of these was a boy, whom they decided to name Tristan. Taylor embraced her role as the quintessential elder sister, providing care, assistance, and support to all her siblings, yet she shared a particularly close bond with her younger brother, Tristan. Despite their age difference, Taylor was not just a sister to Tristan, she was also his best and sole friend. 
The duo was inseparable, engaging in sports, sharing a love for music, and teaming up for playful pranks. The PISM doctrine holds that parenting's paramount goal is to instill the kingdom of God within the hearts of children. As their biological children matured, Jeffrey and Tanya committed to their Christian responsibilities by adopting four more boys from an orphanage, all of whom were open-hearted, affectionate, and sociable. This expansion brought the family size to a total of eight children, Taylor, Twins Kay and Alexis, Misery, Al, Stephen, Miku, and Tristan, further enriching the family dynamics with love and camaraderie. In alignment with the family's devout beliefs, the use of cell phones and engagement with social media platforms were restricted for the children until they reached a specific age, promoting a lifestyle of asceticism concerning their needs and desires. The boys were particularly expected to abstain from dating until they had completed high school, effectively not before turning 18. While religious studies and activities were compulsory aspects of their upbringing in many other respects, the children experienced a normal childhood, akin to their peers. The parents treated all their children, whether biological or adopted, with uniform love, care, and attention, ensuring no disparities were made. The nurturing mother fostered a cohesive family environment, vigilantly overseeing the interpersonal dynamics among her children. Her life was marked by fervent prayer and the performance of benevolent acts, embodying the family's core values and spiritual commitments. The couple held a firm conviction that virtues are best cultivated through personal example and thus demonstrated compassion to their children through their own deeds. In the wake of a devastating hurricane in Haiti, Tanya made the significant gesture of selling her costly wedding ring, donating the funds to a charity focused on constructing homes for those affected by the disaster. In place of her original expensive ring, she chose to wear a modest, inexpensive one, embodying the values of sacrifice and empathy they wished to instill in their family. In 2015, upon graduating from high school, Taylor embarked on a new chapter of her life at Appalachian State University in Boone. This transition profoundly impacted Tristan as he felt he had lost his sole companion and was left to navigate his world alone. Taylor made efforts to return home whenever possible, yet she began to carve out her own independent life, leaving Tristan to grapple with the unchanged, stringent family regulations. His frustration grew over the imposed restrictions he had faced since childhood, and his descent towards his parents' religious beliefs intensified. The prohibition on owning a cell phone and accessing social media platforms became particularly galling for him, as such forms of communication are quintessential to the social lives of contemporary teenagers. Following Taylor's move, the frequency and intensity of disagreements with his parents escalated, highlighting the growing rift in their family dynamics. In December 2017, the family experienced a significant and joyful transition. Jeffrey, along with his spouse and their children, relocated to a new, more expansive residence situated on a large plot of land in Deep Gap, Watauga County, North Carolina. This new home, nestled on a dirt road leading into a forested area, offered considerably more space than their prior residence. Furthermore, it was located less than two miles from the house of Robin, Tanya's mother and the grandmother to the children, providing the convenience of easily seeking her assistance with the younger family members when necessary. However, it remained uncertain whether Tristan found this move equally beneficial, as it necessitated adapting to a new school and community. At his new school in Woogie, he joined the track and field team, while other children found summer employment as camp counselors, marking a new phase of adaptation and potential growth for him amidst these changes. Upon initial observation, the Borless family appeared to be free from any conflicts or problems. However, this perception was misleading. As time passed, Tristan began to exhibit concerning behavior. In 2018, his school recommended multiple meetings with a psychologist due to his anger issues and his inability to control impulsive actions. By 2019, as Tristan entered high school, even though he was highly capable, he started struggling with certain academic subjects, and these challenges seemed to grow day by day. 
previously a conscientious student actively engaged in school activities, he transformed into a disengaged, aloof teenager with a waning interest in his education. Tristan's punctuality for classes diminished, along with any enthusiasm for learning. His disinterest escalated to the extent that he would wear headphones and adopt a detached demeanor during lessons. Although some teachers attempted to reach out to him, and he occasionally responded, these efforts invariably concluded with the same apathy and disinterest. Additionally, Tristan's behavior at home was not always appropriate. By then, he seemed to have everything yet frequently clashed with his parents over his cell phone use and access to social media. Tristan devoted considerable time to the internet, describing himself as a musician on his Instagram profile. Taylor took an active interest in her siblings' lives and observed that Tristan's disputes with their parents, particularly over religious topics with their mother, became more frequent. She also became aware of his academic struggles. Despite attempts to engage with her brother, the once strong bond between them had weakened. Eventually, Tristan formed a connection with Evelyn Faith Jackson, a girl from his religious community. They started seeing each other, paying little heed to the norms against premarital intimacy. Occasionally, they indulged in the use of illicit substances, and Tristan expressed frustration over his mother's habit of discussing his behavior with him at night, leaving him exhausted and unable to focus at school. He was deeply troubled by his perceived shortcomings, feeling he couldn't meet his mother's expectations or make her proud. He felt he could be his true self around his father, but the dynamics with his mother were markedly different. On April 10th, 2019, many hidden aspects of Tristan's life were exposed. Surveillance cameras had been set up in the barn where the goats were housed, and Tristan's old cell phone, which he occasionally used without his parents' knowledge, served as a gateway. That day, Tanya accessed the phone for some reason and discovered text messages where her son engaged in sexually explicit conversations with girls and talked about illegal substances with them. While Tristan was at school, he noticed his phone lighting up with notifications. His parents, taken aback by their findings, messaged him in a family group chat about the discoveries made on his old phone. On that very day, Sher King, Tristan's English teacher, reached out to his mother to voice concerns about the young man's academic performance and conduct. She would later recount in court that Tanya Borlas informed her she and her husband intended to come to the school promptly to fetch Tristan early and have a conversation about his academic situation. Sherry King passed this message on to Tristan, who was noticeably taken aback by the unexpected news. The parents arranged for their youngest child to stay with his grandmother, then proceeded to the middle school to address the unfolding situation. The journey back home was marked by silence. During the trial, Tristan would recount how his mother appeared tense, her brow furrowed in concern as she sifted through his phone. A lengthy discussion ensued at home, lasting approximately 90 minutes. Afterward, Tanya sent a message to her mother, indicating that Tristan had taken the confiscation of his phone and car keys in stride, understanding it as a measure until his grades and behavior showed improvement. She also mentioned that she would soon arrive to collect the younger sibling. The message to her mother was dispatched at 4 p.m. It seems the dialogue between Tristan and his mother extended beyond this. According to Tristan, their conversation delved into the importance of academic success, maintaining respectful interactions with girls, the risks associated with illicit drug use, and her preference for him to explore only Christianity eschewing other religions. During this heart-to-heart, -heart, Tristan was compelled to acknowledge the aspects of himself that needed improvement. Together, they compiled a list of virtues he should embody to become a better person, including compassion and honesty, a list that the police would eventually discover. At a certain juncture, Tristan recounted an incident where his mother unexpectedly came up behind him, wrapped an arm around his neck, and applied pressure. This sudden action caused him to reflexively jump up, turn around, and inadvertently elbow her. He explained that such behavior was uncharacteristic of his mother, which prompted his startled reaction. His mother, taken aback by the impact, seemingly reached for what he believed to be scissors 
and advanced towards him. In a state of shock from the unfolding events, he defended himself, resulting in him stabbing her and then fleeing to his father for assistance. Later forensic analysis revealed no signs of strangulation on Tristan's neck, and during the trial, the prosecution presented photographs taken by the medical examiner that depicted a fractured neck bone, challenging Tristan's account of the events. Neighbors later recounted hearing intense screams emanating from the Boris property around 5.30 p.m. that Wednesday. After the incident concluded, Tristan made his way back into the house, where he vomited, an action the psychologist interpreted as indicative of extreme stress rather than the actions of someone capable of a premeditated killing. Nonetheless, the jury found the psychologist's interpretation unpersuasive, especially when confronted with evidence from the forensic medical examiner during the trial. The autopsy report for Jeffrey B. detailed multiple stab wounds to the left side of the chest and back, lacerations on the arms and hands, and various abrasions on the skull and forehead. At approximately 8.30 p.m., Tristan made his way to his grandmother's residence to collect his younger brother, Robin, which Robin found to be highly unusual. Tristan justified his actions by claiming that their parents had to urgently visit the store and regretfully couldn't spare the time to fetch Robin themselves. Roughly 20 minutes later, Robin received a distressing call from another grandchild who was troubled by the fact that their parents hadn't responded to calls and failed to retrieve him from his part-time job, breaking their usual routine. The grandmother contacted Alexis, requesting her assistance to pick up the concerned grandchild. They decided to convene at Jeffrey and Tanya's home to unravel the situation. Upon their arrival, Robin observed bloodstains on the porch, which didn't immediately alarm her, considering the couple's involvement in animal husbandry. Upon entering the house to retrieve a flashlight for checking on the animals, she was met with a shocking sight. Blood was splattered across the interior. In the midst of this alarming discovery, Alexis burst into the house, frantically reporting that she had stumbled upon what appeared to be a body concealed under the hammock near the animal barn. Furthermore, Alexis claimed to have caught a glimpse of Tristan, his face smeared with blood, speeding away from the scene in a vehicle, suggesting a hasty escape. Upon Alexis's urgent call, emergency services instructed her and all present family members to secure themselves inside their vehicle and await law enforcement's arrival. The police reached the scene within 10 minutes, after a prolonged period spent outside conversing with the officers. The family was escorted to the police station where they received the devastating news that Jeffrey and Tanya Barassi were deceased. As the investigation unfolded at the crime scene, detectives discovered a computer setup that linked to the home's video surveillance system, showing live feeds from various cameras on a monitor. Recognizing the potential significance of this evidence, they promptly sought a warrant to access the system's login details from the company that provided the surveillance service. In the meantime, Tristan reached out to his girlfriend, Evelyn, and made his way to her place. Evelyn noticed that Tristan seemed troubled and observed a few scratches on his forehead and arms. Tristan downplayed the severity of the situation, attributing the scratches to a minor altercation with his parents and claiming they occurred while he was playing with his dog. Evelyn recounted Tristan's injuries, noting three scratches across his forehead, a wound on his hand, a cut on his finger, and a bruised fingernail. Immediately following the incident, Tristan shared a photo of his injuries on Snapchat, attributing them to an encounter with his father's dog. His girlfriend confirmed that the injuries in the photo matched those she had observed on him that evening. Tristan spent the night, and the following morning, they visited Walmart and McDonald's, initially intending to attend school before ultimately changing their plans. Convinced that Tristan simply sought temporary distance from his parents, Evelyn suggested he stay with one of her relatives for a while. He consented, and they embarked on a journey to another state. On April 11th, personnel from the sheriff's office acquired the username and password for the video surveillance system at the Borley residence. After reviewing the camera footage, they uncovered the details surrounding the crime. Police secured a warrant for Tristan's arrest 
and forwarded information about the vehicle he purportedly used to flee to the National Crime Information Center. A search for the car ensued, followed by a subsequent pursuit. Upon receiving information that Tristan had been cited in Tennessee, investigator Matthew initiated the necessary paperwork for extraditing the suspected individual. Due to Tristan's young age, Matthew requested Robin, Tristan's grandmother, to accompany him during the apprehension so that he could engage in a conversation with the young man in her presence. As they traveled in the car with Evelyn, Tristan noticed blue lights trailing them. Suspecting that his parents had reported the car as stolen to locate him, he accelerated and informed his friend of the situation. Tristan accelerated down the highway in an attempt to evade his pursuers, but eventually yielded and pulled over. The Ford found itself surrounded by police cars. Evelyn watched in utter confusion as her boyfriend was handcuffed and escorted away in a squad car. Despite the situation, the officers noted Tristan's lack of apparent distress or agitation. Investigator Matthew conducted an interview with Tristan on April 11, 2019, which was both videotaped and audio recorded. During the interview, the young man cooperated fully, admitting to the crime and providing a detailed account of his actions. He displayed moments of emotional vulnerability, shedding tears at times. Tristan Boris, who was just a month shy of his 18th birthday, was subsequently taken into custody without the option of bail. A warrant was also issued to search the home of Tristan's girlfriend in Boone, where he had been spending the night, according to court documents. Investigators seized a pillowcase, a zippered sweatshirt, and a notebook from the property. The findings from these investigations and searches aided investigators in meticulously reconstructing the sequence of events, even down to the smallest details. The claim of self-defense was deemed unsustainable based on the evidence gathered. The funeral services for the couple took place on April 17, 2019 at Bible Fellowship Church, with pastors William C.R. and Brad Gray presiding over the ceremony. Despite the profound loss of their parents at a tender age, the children summoned the courage to pen a poignant obituary. Our parents never had the chance to live for themselves as they always put us first. Jeff and Tanya were a constant source of joy for us and a continual pride for their parents. They enriched the world with their presence and we aspire to carry on their legacy by embracing love for others fervently and following the path of Jesus. Following the funeral, Taylor made her inaugural visit to her brother in prison and was taken aback by his demeanor. Tristan not only showed no remorse, but also attempted to shift the blame onto the family for the events that transpired. It became apparent to Taylor that her brother harbored a belief that he would eventually regain his freedom, regardless of the circumstances. Disgusted, Taylor abruptly left the visitation room. Her second encounter with Tristan occurred on May 11th, coinciding with his birthday. This time she was accompanied by Grandma Robin, yet the meeting unfolded much like the previous one. Tristan seemed to relish in recounting the birthday celebration organized by the prison staff in his honor. Taylor found his behavior intolerable, particularly in light of their parents' tragic passing. Following this visit, the family collectively agreed to sever all communication with Tristan. The trial commenced on February 16th, 2022. During the proceedings, Tristan expressed remorse for his actions and acknowledged the validity of his family's concerns about him. He fully supported the decision for a permanent ban on contact, recognizing the need for his family's safety. On March 3rd, Tristan Bohr was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for each count of first-degree murder. Judge Horn took into consideration mental health factors, noting that while Tristan Borlas exhibited symptoms of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, according to the psychologist's report, there was no evidence of psychotic disorders. However, the judge emphasized that the exacerbation of anxiety and depression may have been linked to Tristan's continued use of illicit substances. 
The most striking aspect of this narrative is the conspicuous absence of any statements regarding the motives behind the crime from Tristan's family, his legal counsel, or even Tristan himself. It's a perplexing dichotomy, a devout family juxtaposed with a socially precarious individual who engages in illicit drug use, yet neither side offers insight into the underlying reasons behind the tragic events. On one hand, there's the portrayal of a young man seemingly adept at exploiting the situation by either genuinely not comprehending his actions or strategically feigning ignorance. On the other hand, there's the portrayal of a self-loathing individual with diminished self-worth and a susceptibility to depression, outwardly exhibiting symptoms of anxiety, but seemingly lacking access to adequate mental health care. This dichotomy highlights the complexity of the human psyche and the multifaceted nature of the circumstances surrounding the crime. During the court proceedings, it was revealed that Tristan had experienced panic attacks, which his mother had helped him manage, as she herself had a history of such episodes. Additionally, an intriguing aspect of Tristan's upbringing was discussed, a concept akin to the pedagogy of PISM, which posits that children are inherently immoral due to original sin and thus require strict discipline and suppression of self-awareness to cultivate proper behavior. This approach advocates for strict love under the guise of fostering moral development. A child who may have inherited a heightened sensitivity of the nervous system was raised within rigid confines, consistently feeling inadequate as a devout individual. It's acknowledged that some individuals inherently require more affection than others. Recollections from his older sister indicate that the young boy experienced intense jealousy as his parents' attention shifted towards new siblings. Initially, this manifested as rebellion, but gradually evolved into periods of despondency and feelings of inadequacy. These emotional struggles were exacerbated by the use of illicit substances, panic attacks, and episodes of depersonalization to realization. He struggled to align with his parents' religious fervor and felt incapable of meeting his mother's expectations, leading to a sense of being fundamentally flawed and in need of correction. The list of needed fixes could indeed have been a collaborative effort between Tristan and his mother, reflecting their mutual desire to address his challenges. However, instead of seeking out a qualified therapist, this may have been overlooked, representing a missed opportunity for intervention. In a genuinely loving family, it's possible that early recognition of Tristan's struggles, coupled with proactive measures such as seeking professional mental health support, could have averted the senseless and tragic outcome. Thank you for watching. That was David with you.